it seems to me he has only one option if he is to survive, and that is to increase his terror apparatus. Vladimir Putin reminds me very strongly of Ivan the Terrible. Ivan the Terrible was the man who created the Russian Empire, the Tsarist Empire, but with a great deal of cruelty and brutality, but quite effectively. And the point about Ivan was that he launched a war against what we now call the Baltic states, Livonia, and it went on for about 30 years and ultimately failed. He was defeated by a kind of 16th century Volodymyr Zelensky, who emerged in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and forced the Russians back to their borders. But Ivan survived that defeat. This is unusual for an autocrat. Most dictators who lose wars lose power quite quickly, if not indeed before the end of the war. Because popularity does matter, even in dictatorships. Putin has now lost most of the popularity he ever had, and he is already, I think, ruling by fear. If Putin loses all his gains since last February and, and Crimea too, then what we will probably see is not some kind of peace treaty, but a frozen conflict of the kind we've seen on Russia's borders under Putin several times before. How will Putin survive in power? It seems to me he has only one option if he is to survive, and that is to increase his terror apparatus on a completely different scale. Ivan the Terrible survived the loss of the Livonian War only by a year or two. He suddenly had a stroke while playing chess. And I would be surprised if Putin's reign after a failed Ukrainian war is a very long one. One problem for Putin in his survival will be that he has very few allies. Even Belarus is beginning to look a bit shaky. The only ally who has the power to really sustain him is, of course, China. And it's very noticeable that he's been cultivating Xi Jinping in recent weeks and months. The truth is that China has not come to Russia's aid and is very unlikely to do that unless the situation changes. Xi Jinping does not wish to be associated with a loser. In its own way, the Russian Federation is actually a surprisingly resilient beast. And although it's a sprawling one, 143 million people, 83 different uh, constituent elements, plus the six which have been annexed, but nonetheless, I think it's unlikely that we're actually going to see a kind of dramatic collapse. It's much more likely that what we will actually see is a slow almost invisible separatism emerging within, but for autonomy rather than actually people saying, no, we need to be independent countries. As we look forward, I think there's really two main concerns that I imagine is keeping people in the Kremlin awake at night on this. First of all is the sort of the short-term issue precisely about the costs of the war. Now, what we have seen is that the ethnic preponderance of forces is very, very much skewed towards poorer regions, which tends to mean non-Russian ethnic regions. Um, places like Dagestan in the North Caucasus, Buryatia over in the Far East. And obviously more soldiers, you know, essentially representing the fact that these are poor regions where people join the military as an economic choice. But anyway, more soldiers in Ukraine means more casualties, more bodies coming back in body bags, and that sense that in fact it's not fair, that we are the ones fighting for Moscow's conflict. So I think that's going to be one, one of the interesting things to watch, is precisely the degree to which there is this narrative that emerges, as it did, for example, during the Soviet war in Afghanistan, that basically you know, our people, our region, our republic is disproportionately suffering. So that's a kind of a, an immediate con and contingent issue. But the second big concern is just more the, the slow degradation of state capacity in Moscow. Putin is not doing his job. His key job is, after all, to balance off different elite groups. At the moment, he's so obsessed with the war that he's essentially not doing that. And we're seeing a lot of rivalries emerging. 
And that, those rivalries essentially create a degree of gridlock within the political system and a failure of control. And therefore, the, the, the less effectively the Russian Federation central government works, the more that the regions, firstly, will just have to do their own thing, and secondly, will have the opportunity to do their own thing. And therefore, and this again, this is something we saw in the late Soviet era, is precisely that, in fact, what you actually get is a kind of covert fragmentation of the country, in which local elites become more and more powerful, more and more closely intertwined, more and more able to essentially pull the wool over Moscow's eyes as to what's really going on. What might a coup look like in, in Russia? There's some sort of precedents in history, perhaps the most likely, and this is not to say that this is definitely going to happen, but um, a likely scenario, if this were to happen, would be some of Putin's inner circle isolating Putin at, at, at some point, um, perhaps maybe when Putin is away and they manage to arrest him, maybe murder him or, or at the very least arrest him. And then what would happen would be the coup plotters would then try to take over the key state institutions, so the key government buildings, the parliament, the state media. They would then try and communicate what's happening to the public and try and get the, the public on side. And of course they need to make sure as well that they have the, the, the force to back their coup up as well. So they'd need some kind of military backup, the support of the military, the support of the security services, uh, and then they would try and consolidate support deal with any resistance and, and try and win over the, the, the public. What were some of Russia's uh, coups in history? Well, firstly, you have the, the 1917 revolution um, where the, the Tsar abdicated. The war was, the First World War was not going uh, particularly well. And effectively, the generals and uh, so, some of the Russian politicians as well you know, convinced the Tsar that the, the time was, was now to, to abdicate. Then you have the October 1917 revolution. You have Lenin and the Bolsheviks against the backdrop of a weak provisional government. Again, the war was not going very well, continuing social problems. And Lenin and the Bolsheviks stormed the Winter Palace and took over the, the Russian uh, in, institutions um, and, and eventually consolidated control. And then in 1991 you have the coup by the hardliners um, against Gorbachev. Gorbachev was on holiday in the Crimea and the hardliners you know, attempted to arrest him and they tried to take over the uh, key institutions in Moscow, but Yeltsin was able to rally popular support against the coup and Korbachev was, was able to return and the, the coup ultimately ended and that paved the way for Yeltsin to, uh, to rise to power. Now I would say it would take a lot for this coup to happen. Russia's already um, suffered humiliating setbacks and it hasn't happened so far. So. Um, and, and there's been lots of you know, problems and issues with, with the war. So, and Putin has constructed the Russian state to, to really try and prevent these things.